You are listening to Harvest Bible Chapel KL. For more information, please visit our website at www.harvestkl.org. Okay, welcome everyone. Those of you who are new among us, visitors, my name is uh, Larry Loon. I serve as an elder with our senior pastor, Nate, who is currently away. Uh, partnering with our global Great Commission Collective uh, churches. His uh, responsibility is uh, as an international director there. He's fulfilling part of that responsibility uh, this weekend. So you have me, I think, for the last time. Some of you have been praying very hard uh, because... uh, my wife asked me this morning, why are you up so early? Uh, even right up to this morning, uh, the message that the Lord has laid upon my heart, which I believe he has to encourage each one of you uh, and to make you strong, to finish well uh, in life and as God's people. And uh, the Lord has laid upon my heart this uh, topic of finishing well, uh, the Jesus way, right? We are in church. I believe we are all here as God's people. And if you want to finish well, which I believe we all want to, but we have to do so in the way that God, Jesus, whom we have just sung, the Son of God, has laid out for us in the Scripture. Those of you who have been here for some time, you have been listening to sermons for many years, I think a lot of what I'm about to share to you should not be new to you, but I want you to do this one thing, ask the Lord to lay upon your heart just one thought from the many things that I will say that will cause you to do something different from what you have been doing so far. And I believe that if you do that, the Spirit of the Lord will take the word that he has placed upon my heart for you and make it work for you and set you in the direction that you will finish well in the way that Jesus Christ has meant for us to do. That is definitely God's plan, and I'll lay it out for you. And to make sure that you follow me along the way, don't get sidetracked, don't get lost, I'll give you an outline as usual. I will say a few words to outline for you what Jesus says about finishing well. He definitely wants us to do that. But more importantly is Jesus has said something that what finishing well is not. Okay, So I'm going to share with you from God's word today the way that Jesus has taught us that we need to live our life on this earth to finish it the way he meant it to be. If you want to finish it way and well in this life, in the way of the world, you don't need to come to the church, you don't need to refer to the Bible, just go to Mr. Google, stay there, you have all the inspiration notes you need to have to finish well in the world. I'm not talking about that. Right? I'm going to talk to you about finishing well the Jesus way. He has said it in the scripture, and he has also said it what it is not. And you must not go down that way. I'll outline that to you. And there are many examples I could pick out from the Holy Scripture. Right? And after that, I'm going to talk to you about just three kings. King David, King Solomon, and King Manasseh. These three kings, in my view, is unique and has a precious lesson for each of us to understand what it means to finish well the Jesus way, according to the Holy Scripture. And then, to qualify the topic, the Jesus way, I must talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. And after the three kings, I'll bring you, i highlight to you three episodes in the life of Jesus, on the cross, in the Garden of Gethsemane, before he went to the cross, 
and in the desert where he was tempted before he starts his public ministry. I'll take you to some of the reflections in each of these three episodes to bring out to you how Jesus finished well, and he is our model, he is our example for us to follow Christ. Are we not? Jesus Christ come to call disciples to himself. And if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to follow the example that he has set out for us. And I'm going to lay it out for you in these three episodes on the cross, in the garden, and in the desert. And then I will wrap up with some final words of exhortation, mainly closing with Colossians 3, 1 to 2. You can say it's my favorite text because it's a text given to me on the day I was baptized. And every time I believe that is the way God wants us to finish well. Well, my wife and I, those of you who were here last week, you know that the time of our departure from KL is here. We have started our countdown, number of days. Today is 51 days to the last day that I will leave here because my work is done here, both in the office and in some fashion also in this church. So as I was thinking through, and when Pastor Ney gave me this opportunity to speak to you again, I said, what shall I speak on? He said, yeah, speak about how you're going to finish here. And as I go back to Singapore, uh, we don't quite know for certain what lies ahead for us yet. But for sure, uh, Jeannie and I, we use whenever we are in a crowd, we are always among the youngest. Today, you can say, like the psalmist says, you know, that I was once young, but now I'm old. So when we go, out, when we go back to Singapore, we will be counting up our years. We are counting down our days here, but we'll be counting up our years. Uh, so I'm going to share with you in the next uh, hour or so my personal reflection on how to finish well the Jesus way as I understand it from the Bible. But to finish well in the Jesus way or even in any way of the world, Change is necessary, right? Isn't it? That's why I ask you to think, to reflect, and to focus on just one thought today. Make a decision to make one change today. Because there's a saying to say that it is madness to do the same thing over and over again and expect things to change. All right? So if you are not satisfied with your current state, if you're not satisfied with the direction in which you're going, you need to make a change. Whatever that change may be, make a decision today. If you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I hope that by the end of this sermon, you will be challenged and inspired to make that decision to follow Christ. If you have been a believer, but you are still on the fringes, I hope that by the end of today, you will decide to take one step towards the center and be in the mainstream of what God wants to do. So I encourage each one and everyone to consider making one little change today so that you can finish well. You see, Jesus said in Matthew 18, I'm going to give you quite a number of verses. It may not be on the slide today because uh, I told Miriam, who usually helped me prepare the slides, if I give you all the verses today, you'll probably have 100 slides up there. I'm not going to do that. So, but I will give you the verses as we go along, right? And in Matthew 18 and verse 3, Jesus says this, Unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Unless you change. So, change is something that Christ expects, right? And he says, become the little children. That's called entering the kingdom of heaven. And that is, you can say, the finishing part that Christ talks about. And I want to help each 
one of us to look at our own individual lives and see what change is necessary so that you can truly when you become like little children is to humble yourself. I will come back to this point again and again. And that's the reason why I chose this, the three kings. Has got to this, has got to do with this aspect of becoming like little children. Humility so that you will enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't talk about finishing well without talking about the Apostle Paul, right? In fact, when I started uh, preparing this sermon, I was locked on to what Paul said. But I say that, okay, that one you can go to, again, the YouTube, and you will find many messages on finishing well according to the teaching of the Apostle Paul. So I'm not going to go that direction. But I will say this much, that Paul is concerned about finishing well because he wrote to the church in Corinthian, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. I think you all know these verses very well, 1 Corinthians 9 and 24 to 27. He says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. So G Paul obviously is concerned and wanting uh, the Corinthian believers to run in such a way as to finish well, right? Get the prize. Okay? And he says, everyone who competes in the games, that means he's using an analogy of the games or the Olympic games in modern terms, he says, goes into strict training. That means you cannot coast along and uh, be very lexy, you know, less, less logical about it, and expect to win, right? You have to go into strict training. All right? And he says that these uh, runners or Competitors, they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. So in Paul's mind, finishing well has got to do not with this life, but with forever. Okay? And finishing well the Jesus way also has got to do that your sight has to be set beyond this life into the next but it starts here, it starts now, it starts with this life. Then Paul goes on to say in verse 26 of 1 Corinthians 9, he says, therefore I do not run like a man running aimlessly. Right? He has a purpose. He says, I do not fight like a man beating the air, you know, not shadow boxing. Right? He has a target. He says, no, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. So Paul is very clear in his mind. How he lived his life, how he preached, he's doing it to get that crown, that prize that will last forever. And he's concerned that he might not finish well that he would be disqualified for the prize. And when I reflected upon this, there's a lesson for me in my heart, because I preach a lot sometimes, right? Just like Paul. Am I concerned that I might be disqualified? Of course, we are assured of our salvation. We are assured, and so on. We live in that assurance. But Paul is concerned that somehow, we might lose what later on I will talk about Jesus saying about the salt, losing its saltiness, the runner being disqualified from the race and losing the prize. So Paul definitely wants us to finish well and get that prize. And in some way, he wrote a lot about it. You can go, uh, if you are a a Christian, you are a Bible student, you read of all his writing in his letters, you can almost sense the dedication, the passion in the heart of Paul. Like what he says here, he put himself under strict training. He will beat his body so that to make sure that he will end well and get the prize and not be disqualified. And towards the end, when he was writing his final letter to 2 Timothy, 
or to his disciple Timothy in the letter of 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6 to 8. There he says, I'm already poured out like a drink offering, because the drink offering in the Old Testament is the last part of the whole ceremonial sacrificial sacrifice. It says, I'm already poured out like a drink offering, the final part. And the time of my departure had come. 2 Timothy 4 and verse 7, it says, I fought the fight, or I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. And now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed for his appearing. So Paul's sight is not just, he's, he's really coming to the end of his days on earth. But his sight is on yet another day, the day that is yet to come. Paul aimed to finish well, and in a sense, from these words that we now have in 2 Timothy 4, he had finished well, at least in his own eyes. All right? Paul says, God is my judge. Even if I consider myself innocent, I submit to God's judgment upon me on that day. But for sure, Paul wants to finish well, and I think he did, and he taught Timothy, and we have his writings in the whole New Testament about how we ought to live our life here on earth in order to finish well so that we can get that crown and not be disqualified along the way. Now, Jesus, that's all I'm going to say about Paul. Jesus also encouraged us to finish well. Now, where did it say so in Scripture? There's two illustrations that Jesus used in uh, Luke chapter 14. Luke 14 and verse uh, 25 to 35 there, Jesus used the illustration of a builder and a king going to war, a warrior, right? John Luke 14 says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower, right? Will he not first sit down, estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it, right? And if he lays the foundation and not able to finish it, everyone will see it and will ridicule him, isn't it? Right? You know that passage? And then he says, or oh, the other illustration that Jesus used in Luke 14, or suppose a king was about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down to consider whether he's able with 10,000 to come against someone or oppose someone who has 20,000? If he's not able, then he better go and start sending delegations to make terms of peace first, right? And then Jesus says, in the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Jesus is using these two illustrations to bring across to his disciples that he wants us to finish well. But go, finishing well the Jesus way has a cost to it. You need to sit down and count that cost. No point starting and not finishing, then you will be like what Paul was fearful about, that you've been disqualified along the way. So Jesus definitely wants his disciples to understand what he's teaching about being his follower. We cannot earn our salvation. It is all paid for on the cross. But once you believe in Christ, and become his disciple, there is a pathway of discipleship to walk. And that pathway of walking, in my Bible, is always full of surprises. There is joy, and there is blessings. There are pain, and there are rejoicing. If you only think that once you become a Christian, you are walking in the garden of roses, no thorns at all. Every day is sunshine, no rainy day. You are not going to finish the Jesus way. You might be falling along the wayside. 
So Jesus definitely wants us to finish well, but not in the way we might think. Jesus told, or rather in my reflection of what Jesus meant when he wants his disciples to weigh the cost and make sure that they end their race like Paul did and be qualified for the eternal crown. He says finishing well is not about worldly riches, right? We spend a lot of our time, a lot of our energy pursuing our careers to make sure that we have enough and a lot to spare of this world's wealth and riches. Is it not? Right? Look at your own hearts of hearts. Right? We spend a lot of time doing that. There's nothing wrong with that. But finishing well, has got not, in Jesus' way, has got nothing to do with that. And I learned this from a parable that Jesus told in Luke chapter 12. He told the parable about the rich fool. He's already rich, but he's really a fool. He said this, he says, Watch out, be on your guard against all kind of greed. This is Luke chapter 12 and verse 15. He says, A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possession." He told his disciple this parable. He says, the, the, a man's life here does not contain, does not equal the abundance of his possessions. He said this because somebody was disputing with his brother about inheritance. And he asked Jesus, can you please help decide for us? Right? Jesus discerned the heart. They are only thinking about this life and what they can get. So Jesus told this parable about a certain rich man who has this ground, right, that produced them a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? He's really rich and he's got a bounty crop, right? Perhaps some of us are in that situation. We already have a fat bank account, enough to live us for many years, and God bless you some more. So what shall you do? This guy says, well, this is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones and they will be store all my grains and all my goods. And I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid out for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. This is the way of the world, right? And in some ways, this was the conclusion of our King Solomon. I'll come to him later, right? He wrote, he wrote in Ecclesiastes, right? Vanities of vanities. Life is meaningless, right? Just eat, drink, and be merry. But then God says, this is Jesus telling the parable, God says, you fool, this very night, your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Therefore, do not worry about this life. What is Jesus saying in this parable? He's not saying don't work, don't build up treasures. Yes, do. If the Lord bless you with plenty, embrace it. But don't store it up for yourself. Right? That, so that you are not rich towards God. You are rich in this world, but you are not rich towards God. Right? So finishing well the Jesus way has got to do with what you, what you do with what God has provided for you to build up your treasures in heaven so that you will be rich before God. So for sure, finishing well in Jesus' way does not mean you will get rich. If you have been taught this, it's a lie. So if you don't have enough of this world's riches, don't worry. You can still finish well the Jesus way. Second thing that Jesus, I learned from my reading of the scripture about what Jesus said, not finishing well, is you remember there's this incident where Jesus sent out 72 disciples, right, two by two to the different uh, uh, villages, 
and then gave them authority overall, and then they came back rejoicing, reporting to Jesus, right? In Luke 10, you can read about the details in Luke 10, verse 1 to 20. The 72 returned with joy and says, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And then Jesus replied to them, says, Oh, I saw Satan fell like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, and this is the point, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your name are written in heaven. So Jesus is telling the disciples, right? Finishing well is not about having authority on this earth, that even the demons... Uh, uh, listen to me, right? Oftentimes, in our circle, whether it's a secular circle or in our spiritual circle in church, we think that, you know, someone who has a big name, who has authority over others, who can exercise the thing, ah, that person is, finish, is successful and will finish well, right? No? Huh? Jesus says, no, don't rejoice over that. But rejoice rather that your name is written in heaven. So I ask you this morning, is your name written in heaven? Are you sure about that? Jesus says your name is written in heaven. That your name is written in heaven. There is this uh, verse in the last book of the Bible, in Revelation. 21 and verse 17. It says, The names are written in the Lamb's book of life. This written in heaven is written in the Lamb's book of life. How do you get your name into the Lamb's book of life? You need to go to the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus and become his follower then your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But it's not that easy. You see, because that verse in Revelation 21 and verse 27, the complete verse says this. It says, nothing impure will ever enter it, it meaning heaven, the new Jerusalem or our, our heavenly home. Nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You understand what that means? That means if your name is on the Lamb's book of life, you need to live this life to make sure that you walk the path that Jesus has laid out in the Holy Scripture for you and me. So that you will finish the Jesus way. You understand? Because it says nothing impure will ever enter it. So if you are thinking in your mind that, oh, okay, I've got my ticket to heaven. I can do what I like. I can be easy and live my life as I please. Then you be careful. Because then you could be succumbing to what Paul was afraid of, that you might become disqualified along the way. So this is what Jesus is saying that finishing well does not mean that you will get riches in this world. Finishing well doesn't mean that you will be great and have a lot of power and authority in this life. So what does finishing well mean? Can we all finish well? I know we all want to, right? But can we all finish well? Answer is yes, right? It's God's will for us. Definitely we can. And I want to illustrate to you to the next three kings. Okay? I picked these three kings, King David, King Solomon, and King Manasseh, basically to bring, to illustrate one point, that everyone can finish well provided that is a provided, there is an if. We repent and return to God wholeheartedly. 
King David, we all know him. He's a famous king. He started well and he finished well, right? He ruled for 40 years. And in a sense, he became the gold standard for kingship, isn't it? Right? If you read all the Old Testament kings, right? There are many kings. In fact, other than King David or King Saul, King David and King Solomon who rule over a united kingdom, the rest after Solomon, uh, the kingdom of Israel were divided into two, right? Ten tribes to the north and two tribes to the south, Okay? And the 19 kings over the 10 tribes in the north, none of them were good. Some kings, also there are 19 kings on the south, the Judah, right? Some of them were good, about 8 or 9 of them, depending on how you count, okay? Right? So I could have picked a lot, okay, but I chose these three. Basically to illustrate to you, or at least in my own mind, that every one of us can finish well. David is a good example. He started well, he finished well, but we all know that he also collapsed midway big time, isn't it? Right? Um, when Saul disobeyed God, we read this in 1 Samuel 13, he disqualified himself. God promised Saul that he will have his kingdom until the end. But because he disobeyed God, the word was sent to Saul through Samuel. In 1 Samuel 13, he says, But now your kingdom will not endure. This is God talking through Samuel to King Saul. He says, But the Lord will look, will sought, will seek after a man after his, his own heart and appoint him as leader over his people. So David was described by God as the man after God's own heart, right? The psalmist in Psalm 78 described it this way. Psalm 78, uh, 70, the last few verses of Psalm 78, it says, God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pen, from tendering sheep. He brought him to become the shepherd of his people. And then verse 72, it says, David shepherded them with integrity of heart and with skillful hands, he led them. So David started well and finished well because his heart was at the right place with God. And God always desired shepherds, which he described as people looking after his people as those who are after his own heart. That's why even after all the kings has failed in Jeremiah, there's this verse in Jeremiah 3 and verse 15. It says, I will give you this a promise. After, after uh, some of the people have already begun to be exiled to Babylon and to, to Assyria, God promised and told the nation of Israel through prophet Jeremiah, says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart. This is the description of King David who will lead you with knowledge and understanding. And in a sense, that's what Jesus is, right? So we need to finish well, like King David did the Jesus way, by making sure that our heart is with God. But we know he, David fall big time, right? He, he failed to resist a temptation, right? You read all about it in 2 Samuel 11, where he committed sin big time, adultery with Bathsheba. And then after that, he tried to cover it up, arrange the murder of Uriah, one of his famous mighty men. Uh, the, you read in the Old Testament, at least, at least of 30 or 33 of them. And Uriah, one of them, his mighty men, who would fight and lay his life for David. And King David, to cover up his adultery with this woman, arranged for Uriah to be murdered by the sword of the Amorites. And God saw all that. And yet, David finished well. Why? The 
The scripture says that David repented fully. He repented genuinely and turned towards God. You read of his repentance, his words of anguish in the Psalms. Right? And because he repented fully, God forgave him. So, the point I'm sharing here about King David here is that you can start well and you can still finish well, although you mess up big time. So, if some of you think that you have already messed up somehow, God is going to come crashing down on you with his punishment and curses. Take comfort in King David. <clears throat> that so long as you repent fully as King David did, you can still finish well just as King David did. He is the yardstick that God used to measure all kings after him, even after he has sinned and fallen big time. But beware, there's this verse in Jeremiah 3 and verse 10. That unlike David, which repented genuinely, there are those in Israel who only repented in pretense. You know what I mean by pretense? Faking it. Right? So sometimes if we come and we think that you've done something wrong and you just fake your repentance and so on, God sees it all, He knows it all. You can't hide from God. But if you were to repent fully, God will forgive you and sting you and, and you can still finish well just as King David did. Solomon. Well, he got everything going for him. He started well, isn't it? Solomon, David prepared everything for him. Right? David's heart is set on God. He wanted, he started well, he defeated Goliath, right? In the name of God, right? Uh, only with a sling and a stone against the giant with short shield and spear, right? So God honored David. Solomon, or David wanted to build the temple, right? God, God says, you, you did well. You had it in your heart. To honor me, to build. But he says, no, your son Solomon will build it uh, for me. So Solomon, when he started his uh, kingship, his life, uh, God was pleased with him, right? You all know the story of how God asked when David passed on and Solomon started, he started to build uh, the temple, right? God Ask him, what is it that you want me to, to give you? Ask for anything, I'll give it to you. And Solomon was very, says, oh, just give me a discerning heart, uh, wisdom, so that I can govern your people well. And God was so pleased with him. He says, I'll give you that and more. What you didn't ask, the life of your enemies, riches and honor, I'll bless you with all that. So Solomon had it good at the beginning for the first part of his reign, God appeared to him twice. I'm not sure whether I read in my record correctly that God ever did appear to David in the manner that he appeared to, Saul, uh, to, to Solomon. After Solomon completed the temple and when he do all the sacrifices and the glory of God came down and so on, God appeared to Solomon a second time. And so God told Solomon this. If you walk with integrity of heart and uprightness as David, your father, did. See? David, the gold standard. Right? God told Solomon, you need to walk with integrity of heart and uprightness as David, your father, did. And do all I command. I will establish your throne forever. Up to this point, Solomon was doing well. Unfortunately, just one chapter later, in 1 Kings 11, Solomon's downfall came because he loved foreign women. 
We all know the famous feature of Solomon, right? He has 700 wives, 300 concubines. Wow! Once your heart is not in the right place, you will not finish well. And that's Solomon's problem. He had it all going for him. But because when he, in the later part of his life, the scripture says, as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted as the heart of David, his father, had been. And then God, because Solomon turned, then God in 1 Kings 11, verse 14, and the second half, all the way to 41, says that God raised up adversaries against Solomon. So Solomon in his second half, failed. He didn't finish well, although he had everything going for him. I bring up Solomon's cases because some of us are like that. We think we are doing well. We have God's blessing more than we envisage. And then something happens. Our heart is in the wrong place. We make a decision that turns away. And the problem with Solomon was that he clung on to those foreign wives which lead him to turn away from God because he builds up all the idolatry and so on. And the scripture says he clung on to that until he died. So Solomon didn't finish well because he didn't turn around. He did not repent. Unlike Manasseh, you read Manasseh, the story is very unusual. If you read only 2 Kings 21, the record of King Manasseh, the record in 2 Kings 21 says that Manasseh is an evil king. Bad king, for sure. I had that conclusion too, until I read 2 Chronicles 33. 2 Chronicles 33 records an, an episode in Manasseh's life that is not in 2 Kings 21. In 2 Chronicles 33, it says this of Manasseh. You see, Manasseh was an evil king of Judah. Judah is, a, is the southern king of uh, the, the two tribes. He did evil in the Lord. He followed all the distress detestable uh, practices of the nations that the Lord has driven out before them. And the record says that Manasseh led Judah and the people of Jerusalem astray so that they did more evil than the nations that the Lord had destroyed before them. So what happened? The Lord basically exiled them. Right? Manasseh was exiled to Babylon. In 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 11, it says, The Lord brought against uh, Manasseh in Jerusalem at that time the army commanders of the king of uh, Assyria. And they took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, and brought him and bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. So Manasseh was exiled. But in 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 11, it says this, Manasseh repented. Imagine this. In verse 12 of 2 Chronicles 33, it says, In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his father. That means when Manasseh was in exile in Babylon, he repented. He sought the favor of the Lord. And verse 13 of 2 Chronicles 33 says, And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreatment and listened to his plea. So the Lord brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. 
Manasseh started bad. But he finished well. Why? Because he repented. He turned away. When God showed his favor, brought him back from Babylon to uh, Jerusalem, the record says in 2 Chronicles 33, verse 14 to 16, it records how Manasseh got rid of all the foreign gods. He removed the images that are in the temple of the Lord, as well as all the altars that he had built before he was exiled. That means everything that he did bad before, and God exiled him. When he came back, he got rid of everything. And then he restored the altar of the Lord and reinstituted the sacrifices and offerings that the Lord has commanded through Moses. So I brought to you these three kings to illustrate that whatever our state may be, you may be like David, mess up big time. I don't know what your particular mess is, but perhaps not as bad as King David. But God still allowed King David to finish well. <clears throat> but don't be like Solomon, where everything was going for him, but he never repented. He held on to his lust until the end. But be like Manasseh, some of you. You may not have started well. You think you may not be. But so long as you're prepared to seek God's favor, repent of your past, and return to the Lord, He will show you His favor. Now I must quickly go to Jesus. Jesus finished well on the cross. He overcome the pain. I finished Jesus on the cross because the scripture says that he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. In John 19 and verse 30, Jesus, while hanging on that cross, says that it is finished. Jesus, in, before John 19, there was early part of the Gospel of John, chapter 4, remember that <clears throat> uh, scene when Jesus was uh, by the well. The disciples went away to buy food and came back. And uh, Jesus told the disciples that, no, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And in John 14 and 31, Jesus says, the world must learn that I love the Father and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. So when Jesus came, his purpose was the cross. And he ended up on that cross, right? But when he ended up on that cross, he endured many pains. Emotional pains, right? The crowd and the rulers, the soldiers, they were all ridiculing, they were staring at him, they were heaping insults at him. He endured all that emotional pain. He didn't give up, so to say, right? He endured the physical pain. He hung on that cross for, from 9 in the morning, until three in the afternoon. Six long hours he hung on that cross. The physical pain he had to endure. And he endured the spiritual pain, right? On the cross he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus paid that price, he endured that pain for you and for me. And if we, if we want to finish well, we need to walk in that footsteps. I don't have time to elaborate more, but just to say this one point. 
that while he was hanging on that cross, there were these people who were shouting at him, come down from the cross, save yourself and save us as well, right? You and I are very thankful that Jesus did not choose to come down from that cross. He chose to hang up there. He could have come down, right? Because before he went to the cross, he was in the garden. I'll come to that shortly. Right? When Peter tried to defend him, he says, tell Peter, no. Don't you think that I can call my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But then how would the scripture be fulfilled and say that it must happen this way? Jesus finished well on the cross and he chose to stay on that cross when people were calling him to come down from the cross, show yourself if you are the son of God. He stuck there to the cross until the end. And we need to be like the Lord Jesus Christ to endure the pain, whatever our pain might be. Some of us may be going physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain, whatever it is. The Lord knows it all. He went through it all and he chose to stay on that cross. You see, Jesus suffering on that cross is greater than, we all, when we talk about suffering, we always talk of Job, right? We all know Job. Job suffered big time. He didn't know what was going on. And Job could do nothing to end his suffering. And he responded with very bitterness in his heart, right? But your Jesus, the Jesus that we know, when he was hanging on that cross, and he, when he was asked to come down, he could have come down. But he chose not to. Why? Because he was thinking of you and me. He needed to finish well on that cross to leave us an example so that we may walk in his footsteps. Jesus has the power to end it if he wanted to on that cross, but he chose not to. And Jesus didn't die like the other two thieves who died because that's the physical pain, right? The crucifixion is the torturous physical pain the Romans have invented. And they die naturally of that physical torture. Jesus did not die of that. When he has finished his job on that cross, the scripture records say, he just gave up his spirit. He says, into your hand, Father, I commit my spirit. And he went. Jesus Christ did not die like all the other thieves. He died willingly on the cross for you and for me. I must move on quickly. My time is almost finished. Jesus finished well in the garden. Before the cross was the garden. And in the garden, Jesus struggled. He was overwhelmed to the point, he was sorrow to the point of death. He prayed, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Jesus finished well on the cross because he finished well in the garden first. He was struggling. He says, Father, could you find another way? We all know the answer. Jesus knew the answer. Jesus submitted to the will of the Father. He says, if it is not possible, your will be done. Jesus finished well in the garden of prayer. He agonized. The scripture says he perspired, sweating like drops of blood. 
And you know what? As I was reflecting this, who was with Jesus at this time? The disciples. And what were they doing? Sleeping. And Jesus said to them, Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. And I think that in the garden, Satan was having another go at Jesus, tempting him to give up. Tempting him, the cross is not the way for you to go. That's why I asked the Father, can you find another way, please? Watch and pray. We need to be like Jesus, finishing well in our agonizing prayer, submitting ourselves to do God's will. When you come to God in prayer, you don't arm twist God and say, please do it this way for me, please. God is God. When you come to God in prayer, you submit to his will. You need to watch and pray so that you will not fall in temptation. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the time has come or the hour has come for Jesus to fulfill God's purpose for him on earth, right? That's why he says on the cross, it is finished. <clears throat> Paul writes in Romans 13, after reflecting about the gospel, he says, the hour has come for us too to wake up from our slumber. And Paul was writing this to believers, just like the disciples in the garden. They were sleeping, and Paul was waking up these people. He says, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than we first believed. And Paul writes that we, the night is nearly over, the day is almost here. Paul is always looking for that day to come, right? That day of accounting, the, the Lord Jesus Christ will come again. So he says, let us put aside the deeds of darkness, Romans 13 and verse 12, and put on the armor of light. We need to change. Unless you change, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. He says, let us behave decently not like those uh, people in darkness, right? It says, rather clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And that's the problem. Oftentimes we think, how do I get this? How do I get that? Paul says, no, don't think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And Paul concludes Romans 15. He urged the brothers there. He says, please join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Just as Jesus finished well in the garden, we need to join him in his struggle. Today, in prayer, in 2 Corinthians 1, Paul writes this to the Corinthian church. He says, you have helped me by your prayers that many will give thanks on our behalf because of the gracious favor granted to God to us in answers to the many prayers of you. That's why we always encourage all of you to pray. If you have needs, fill out the prayer form. The church we we'll pray for you. So we need to finish well the way Jesus did in the garden. And Jesus finished well also before the garden at the beginning of his public ministry in the desert. You all know the story of Jesus' temptation, right? How at the start, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights after he was revealed to the world that this is the Son of God who will take away the sin of the world. The temptations that Satan came to Jesus in the desert, he says, if you are the Son of God, you see, the, this is Satan trying to tempt Jesus, right? 
we all read through our studies in the Gospel of Mark so far, right? Even Satan's disciples, the demons, they all recognize who Jesus is, right? Every time the demon came and they saw Jesus, they fell down at his feet and says, you are the son of the most high God. And here is Satan, the boss of all these demons, coming to Jesus and says, if you are the son of God. Satan knew he was the son of God. Satan was trying to get Jesus to question his identity. Right? You need to stand firm. You want to finish well, like Jesus did in the desert when he was tempted. Jesus confronted Satan each time with the word of God. It is written. Jesus is confident of his identity that he is the son of God. Right? Satan wants Jesus, who is God. They, Satan knows that. But he wants Jesus to waver. If you are the son of God, do this. Jesus will not succumb to that. And if we want to finish well the way Jesus did in the desert, we need to resist. And we need to know what is written in the Holy Scripture. Satan wants Jesus to bow down and worship him. Right? If Jesus has succumbed to that, well, Satan would be God, isn't it? God bowing down to worship me. And the third temptation, Jesus, uh, Satan in the desert told Jesus, he says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world. Right? And thank God that Jesus didn't bow down to Jesus, I mean to, to Satan. Because if Jesus had done that, whoa, Satan would have given him the kingdoms of this world. But then, he would have forfeited the kingdom and the authority of heaven, right? After Jesus died on the cross, finished well, he rose from the dead. We all now know the Great Commission, right? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If Jesus has succumbed to the temptation of Satan in the desert, he would only have become the king of this world. He would have forfeited the kingdom and the authority of heaven. So Satan is very sly, right? Oftentimes, he comes to us in that similar fashion. He will tempt you with something on this earth. He has the authority to give, that's true. But if you succumb to it, you will forfeit something larger. Right? That's why Paul is so careful. He says, I want to make sure that I don't get disqualified. I want to make sure that I get that prize. So if Jesus had stumbled at any point in the desert when he was tempted or in the garden when he was agonizing in the way he was also tempted there or on the cross if you have chosen to come down and not stay up there, Jesus would not be that perfect lamb that is capable of taking us, uh, taking away our sin. He would have been a blemish. He would have become imperfect, right? Then the whole salvation plan would have fallen apart. We thank God that Jesus finished well on the cross, in the garden, and in the desert. And he leaves us this example so that we would also walk in his footsteps. I must conclude now. My time has already well passed. But let me say this. In conclusion, the verse in Philippians 2 and verse 8, in some ways we sung about this this morning. Philippians 2 and verse 8 says this, that Jesus finished well because he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Obedience is the Jesus way to finish well. And we need to do that, right? 
In John 13 and verse 15, Jesus said, I set you an example that you should do as I have done. In John 13 and verse 17, it says, Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. As last, last week we heard uh, Pastor Ben says this, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And John 15 verse 10 says, If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, follow David, not Solomon. You need to obey God's command until the end. I won't have time to elaborate this, but you go back and read 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17 is a summation of what happened to all the 19 kings of Israel. And it says all of them has, didn't finish well because they have, abandoned, they have abandoned the Lord. You see, the scripture says there in verse uh, 15 of John, 2 Kings 17, it says, they follow worthless idols and themselves became worthless. Okay? So, what is in your heart will determine your value before God. If in your heart, like Solomon, you abandon God and you become disobedient to Him, your value before God diminishes. And if you persist in that, you will become like salt that has lost its saltiness. And Jesus says that you're good for nothing. You'll be thrown out and trash. Right? And this is what happened to the nation of Israel in 2 Kings 17. So, to finish well, you need to follow in the footsteps of the Lord Jesus Christ. That although you are tempted, you need to resist it. You need to know the scriptures, right? In order to be able. In, I spoke of this before in, in Colossians 3 and verse 16. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Your capacity to resist the evil one and win and overcome is in proportion to your understanding and your equipment, equipping with the word of God in your heart. Which is why we share God's word all the time, every week. So you want to finish well, the Jesus way, you need to make a decision to absorb more of God's word into your heart, understand it more, and obey. I'll finish with Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. The worship team can come up now. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 basically says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, set your heart on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. For when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. This is how we will finish in days to come. When Christ comes, we will appear with Him in glory. Will you be part of this finishing? Then you need to set your heart right. You need to set your heart on things above, not on things of this earth. Scripture says, do not love this world or the things of this world. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, the pride of life. They will all pass away, but only those who does the will of God will endure forever. So whatever you do, make sure you do it with all your heart, repentance, genuinely and fully. In closing, let's rise and sing this song. Set my heart. I've set my heart on you, God. Submit every part of your life to Him. Let God's word be louder in your life than your fears. 
Let God's joy be greater than your grief. And He will make a way even if there's no way. And He will do that even now. 